Welcome back. Today, we are airing part two of my conversation with Johan Hari. He is a journalist and the author of Magic Pill, The Extraordinary Benefits and Disturbing Risks of the New Weight Loss Drugs. And just to remind you, last week, Johan told us why Ozempic and similar semaglutide drugs might change our world as much as the cell phone. We talked about why these drugs are such a game changer for helping people with obesity and what the ripple effect might be when half of North Americans are taking these drugs in 10 years. Today, we continue the conversation with more about the real risks of these drugs, who should consider them and who definitely should not. We're going to talk about what happens when you go off the drugs and whether it's even possible to maintain the weight loss. And then we talk about the society and the environment that has created the obesity crisis in the first place and how we can get to the root of the problem without drugs. Let's go. It's time to get your head out of your ass and start creating a life of no regrets. Whether you want to lose weight, get rich, or manifest a hot threesome on the beach, you're going to want to turn this up. This is Goals, Grit, and Some Woo-Woo Shit with your host, best-selling author and professional butt kicker, Una Duncan. Well, okay, but Johan, I'm, I'm feeling like I can imagine people listening to this and they're like, whoa, there's a magic weight loss thing. And okay, so I have to worry about, you know, I won't get malnutrition. Fine, fine. I'll figure that out. And I have to like figure out my feelings. Okay, fine. And then they're like, okay, sign me up. And what, what are the other cons that people need to be really aware of before they start messing with what is essentially your brain? Yeah, I think you phrased that exactly right. Um, there's a few that are quite significant. Um, so generally when you speak to experts on this about the safety of the drugs they say actually we know quite a lot about these drugs because diabetics have been, type 2 diabetics have been taking them for 18 years now and so we actually know quite and there's a huge number of diabetics all over the world have been taking them because in addition to having this effect on appetite they also stimulate the creation of insulin which is obviously what diabetics need and they don't put it as crudely as this but basically they say if the drugs made you grow horns the diabetics would have horns by now right um and that's a good point and an important point, and it should give us some reassurance. But some other scientists have said, well, hang on, if we're going to base a huge amount of our confidence of the safety of these drugs on diabetics, let's do a little bit more digging into the diabetics. So, for example, there's a brilliant um, French professor called Jean-Luc Fayet, who's at the University Hospital in Montpellier, who was commissioned by the French Medicines Agency to look into the safety of these drugs for the French market. And he started looking at the evidence. And he was really alarmed by something in the animal studies. If you give these drugs to rats, you massively increase their risk of getting thyroid cancer. And there's a sort of plausible way that could be happening as well, what's called a mechanism of causation, because in addition to having GLP-1 receptors in your gut and your brain, you have them in your thyroid and rats do too. So it kind of makes sense. So if you're screwing with GLP-1, maybe it's having an effect on the thyroid. So what he did is he looked at a huge database in France. I've got very good medical databases in France. He looked at a huge medical database of loads of diabetics who've been taking these drugs. And he compared them to very similar diabetics who had not taken the drugs. And what he calculated, this is disputed, but what him and his team calculated is that these drugs increase your risk of developing thyroid cancer by more than 50%. Now, it's important to understand what that doesn't mean. That doesn't mean if you take the drug, you've got a more than 50% chance of getting thyroid cancer. Obviously, if that was the case, we'd be having bonfires of Ozempic all over the world. What it means is, if he's right, and this is contested and some other scientists disagree, whatever your thyroid cancer risk was at the start, if you take these drugs, it goes up by a little bit over 50%, right? Now, thyroid cancer is relatively rare. 1.2% of people get it in their lives. 84% of people survive. So it's relatively small, but it's a big increase in a relatively small risk, right? If he's correct. There's lots of other potential areas of risk. Um, there's concern about pregnant women because we know that when you give these drugs to rats, their babies are significantly more likely to have birth deformities. Um, the one that most worries me for myself is just the long-term effects. Right. So, Because you're on these for life, right? That's the idea. I mean, that's disputed as well. But the, okay. what the drug companies say is that these drugs work as long as you take them and they stop working when you stop taking them. So it's like statins or blood pressure meds or whatever, that when you stop using the drugs, you regain the weight. There's only one study that shows that. We've got one study of it, but it did find that. Obviously, drug companies have a vested interest in telling us we have to take them forever. But uh, some there do seem to be some minority of people who use them 
take them to interrupt their habits, stop and manage to maintain a lower weight. But they do seem at the moment to be a minority. We'll know more about that in a few years. But um, but if we think about the long term risk, you're right. If the drug companies are right, you're going to have to take them. You know, I'm 45. I hope I live as long as three of my grandparents to the age of 90. So I'm going to be taking these for 45 years, right? What are the effects of taking a drug that changes your brain for 45 years? Um, the short answer is we don't know. Um, the, uh, Dr. Greg Stanwood, who's um, a brilliant researcher of these drugs at Florida State University, said to me, now he stressed that he's broadly confident in taking these drugs. Indeed, he's thinking of taking them himself. But there's a concern he raised with me, which uh, I found quite alarming. And I want to be clear, he's not saying these drugs will have this specific effect. He's drawing an analogy. So if we think about antipsychotic drugs, if you go back to the early 60s when they started being given to people, doctors judged the benefits outweighed the risks. 40 years later, it was discovered if you take these drugs for 40 years, you're much more likely to get dementia. In fact, all forms of dementia are made much more likely by taking antipsychotics. Now, it's not that the doctors back in the 60s were being negligent. They didn't know. There was just no way you could know that until you'd have people taking these drugs for a really long time. Now, there's no reason to think these drugs will cause dementia, but specifically, but it just raises the question of there could just be some unknown and unpredictable long term effect. Right. Given that these drugs are activating really important parts of the brain. Um, in fact, when you give them to when you give these drugs to rats and then you cut their brains open, which obviously you can't do to humans, you see that these drugs affect ev go everywhere in the brain and affect every part of the brain, right? So not like a trivial part of you, the brain, right? Um, but against that, so I, that's a real concern for me. It's my biggest single worry for myself, although I've got an even bigger worry for the society that we can come back to. Um, against that, I think a lot about something that Dr. Shauna Levy said to me. So she's a brilliant obesity specialist at the Tulane University School of Medicine in New Orleans. And Dr. Levy said to me, we don't know the long-term effects of these drugs. We do know the long-term effects of obesity and they're catastrophic. So the long-term effects of these drugs would have to be, this is me speaking now, the long-term effects of these drugs would have to be absolutely horrendous to outweigh the long-term risks of obesity, right? Um, now they might be. The previous most popular weight loss drug, Fenfen, which was a huge thing in the 90s, literally did turn out to be more harmful than obesity. Um, it caused all sorts of horrific problems. Um, so it's, it's, it's possible. We don't know. We're living with a level of indeterminacy and risk. In a sense, it's which risk do you want to take? Do you want to, as I say, if you can, if, there's, if, you, if the third option, diet and exercise works for you, obviously you get out of this dilemma. But if it doesn't, the dilemma is risks of obesity, risks of the drugs. Right. Um, you know what's interesting? When I first heard about it, obviously, uh, there's a little bit of unease around, oh my gosh, what is this doing to us physically? And we kind of don't know yet. Sure. But then there's this other sort of um, gut reaction, haha, -ha, that you think, um, wait a second, that's cheating. It's not supposed to be that easy. What does that yeah. say about us that we have this reaction that you're supposed to earn your thin body? What do you think about that? I'm so glad you said that because I had exactly the same thought about myself. When I was taking the drug, I thought, I'm doing something really wrong. Like, I felt like I was doing something immoral. I was thinking, why is that? Like, one of my best friends takes statins to control his cholesterol. It has never occurred to me to turn to him and go, yeah, cheat, <laughs> right? right? Getting yeah. ahead of me in cholesterol, what you doing, <laughs> right? It, I mean, if I said that, you'd think I was insane, right? Yeah. And I, I did a lot of digging into the history of how we think about obesity. And I think the answer lies there. Just like these drugs are bringing to the surface a lot of the underlying emotional reasons why we eat, I think they also bring to the surface a lot of the deep, almost unspoken ideas about obesity that we have that go really far back in the culture. If you go back to the 6th century, the Pope, Pope Gregory I, was the first person to write out the seven deadly sins. And one of them is gluttony, right, which is always depicted with some hugely obese person kind of pigging out, right? Um. And it's very deep in our culture, the idea that obesity is a sin that needs to be punished, right? One of the ways you know that is you think about what are the forms of weight loss that we admire? The only forms of weight loss we admire where we'll kind of go, okay, we forgive you now, are ones that involve terrible suffering, right? So think about that gross, repulsive game show, The World's Biggest Loser, for people who haven't seen it. It's a really evil game show where they get very severely obese and vulnerable people who are actually very unwell. 
and they get them to take part in very risky forms of extreme st- starvation or extreme humiliating forms of exercise. And the, yeah, and the idea is that the biggest loser, i.e. the one who loses the most weight, wins, right? We admire them, right? Well, like, oh, yeah, okay, you sinned, but yeah, went you. to hell You've and repented. now we let you, exactly, right. yeah. and we let you come back, right? Yeah. So I think there's partly that, I think there's also, we live in an environment that makes it very hard to us be a, for us to be a healthy weight and very easy to be obese, right? Because of the kind of food we eat is completely unlike the food that human beings ate before us and affects our bodies in a completely different way. I can unpack that more because it's really important to understanding how we got to this point. But in that environment, lots of people, particularly women, are every day making quite painful sacrifices to not be fat, right? They're going hungry. Um, And I can well understand why to them, someone like me, Tekio Zempic, looks like how I imagine Lance Armstrong must look to a cyclist. Well, I make all these sacrifices to not be fat. I go to the gym for an hour a day and I deprive myself of everything. And you, you just inject yourself once a week in the leg and you get to be like me. Screw you, right? So you can see where this comes from. But I think what we have to do, what it gives us an opportunity to do is to rethink these deep underlying ideas about obesity. Obesity is not a sin. And I do think there's a race here, but it's not you versus me. It's all of us against the factors deep in our culture that are driving up obesity. And instead of tearing each other down, we can do that if we want. Every time we find out someone's taking a Zempit, we can scream at them and tell them they're a cheat and tell them they're disgusting and bad people. Or we can unite against the forces that are making all of us fatter than we need to be and are poisoning our children. To me, that, that seems to me a much healthier way of responding to this, this opportunity that these drugs give us to rethink some of these deep underlying ideas. Yeah. So can you tell, tell us more about that, about what, what has caused, because I think that's the other unease. It's we're like, we're not dealing with the root problem here. The root problem is the fact that everyone's, gotten so much more obese so quickly. Um, and so that's a little bit of we're like, wait a second, you're cheating. Um, you're not earning your thin pri- privilege. And B, <laughs> wait a second. Um, what's the problem here? Why do we all have to take these drugs? What are we, what's the problem that we're trying to cure with these drugs? This episode is brought to you by the Masters of Fitness Awesomeness program. Here's someone who wants to tell you what that is. I've been in the MFA about six months, and it's been a truly transformative experience for me. And over the last six months, I really feel that I have recovered my sense of myself as an active person and that change in my life. I really seen all of these amazing people working on the same project that I am, which is to take good care of myself so I can live a kick-ass life has really been inspiring and the guidance and support that I've gotten from the team has not only helped me to lose weight and feel better in my joints and improve my PMS symptoms, but also improve my inner monologue so that I'm not as harsh on myself, so that I don't believe my own BS as much and reach out for help when I need help because it's there. This team is really there for you when you need them. I say give it a try best in yourself and see what you can do. I think it's really important to understand how recent and freakishly unusual in human history the obesity crisis is. So I would just judge everyone watching and listening to pause this podcast for a second and Google something for me. Google photographs of beaches in Canada in 1979, the year I was born. And just look at them for a minute and then come back. Okay, so if you looked at that, what you will have seen is something that seems really strange to us. Pretty much everyone in those photos looks to us to be skinny or jacked. You look at it and go, well, where was everyone else on the beach that day? Was it like a skinny person convention? And then you look at the figures. Human beings existed for 300, 350,000 years. And obesity always existed, but was exceptionally rare. And then in my lifetime, it massively exploded. So as you can tell from my weird Downton Abbey accent, I am British. Um, In the year I was born, 6% of British people were obese. 
it's now 27% and rising, right? Between the year I was born and the year I turned 21, obesity more than doubled in the United States. And then in the next 20 years, severe obesity doubled again, right? Staggering. Why did it happen, right? Obesity goes from being very rare to almost being the norm, right? A majority of Americans and Canadians and British people are now overweight or obese. What happened? We know what happened. This change happens everywhere that makes one change. It's where people go from mostly eating fresh whole foods they prepared on the day to mostly eating processed or ultra processed foods, which are assembled in factories. They're built out of chemicals in a process that isn't even called cooking. It's called manufacturing food. Um, and it turns out this new kind of food that is totally different to what our ancestors ate affects our bodies in a completely different way. I go through the seven ways it affects us differently in the book. I'll give you an example of one experiment. Sorry, I'll give you an example of an experiment that to me just totally distills it. I've nicknamed this experiment Cheesecake Park. It's not the official name. Um, so it was carried out by a brilliant scientist called Dr. Paul Kenny who's the head of neuroscience at Mount Sinai in New York. It's a very simple experiment. He got a load of rats and he raised them in a cage. And all they had to eat was the kind of fresh whole foods that rats evolved to eat over thousands of years. And when that's all they had to eat, the rats would eat when they were hungry and they would stop when they were full. They seemed to have some natural nutritional wisdom that said, hey guys, you've had enough, stop. They never became fat or, or overweight when they had the kind of natural food they evolved for. Then Dr. Kenny introduced them to the American diet, get ready to salivate. He fried up some bacon, he bought a load of Snickers, he bought a load of cheesecake, and he put it in the cage alongside the healthy food. Okay. And the rats went apeshit for the American diet. I don't know if rats can go apeshit, but they went crazy for yeah, the American yeah. diet. They would literally dive into the cheesecake and eat <laughs> their way out Which and just emerge fantasy. just... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> completely slicked with cheesecake, right? Um, and they ate and ate and ate and ate and ate and ate and ate. The way Dr. Kenny put it to me was within a couple of days, they were different animals. All that nutritional wisdom that they had before in the past, when they had the kind of food they evolved for, disappeared. And they all became severely obese. Then Dr. Kenny tweaked the experiment again in a way that feels a bit cruel to me as a former junk food addict. He took away the American diet and left them with nothing but the healthy food they'd had before. And he was sure he knew what would happen. They would eat more of the healthy food than they had in the past. And that would prove that exposure to junk food expands the number of calories you eat in a day. That is not what happened, Una. Something much weirder happened. Once they'd had the American diet and it was taken away, they refused to eat the healthy food at all. It was like they no longer recognized it as food. It was only when they were literally wasting away that they finally grudgingly went back to eating it. Now, I would argue we are all living in a version of Cheesecake Park. If you've ever been into a branch of Tim Hortons, you're living in a ver version of Cheesecake Park, right? We are, you know, 67% of the calories the average American child eats in a day are ultra processed foods. That means fr from ultra processed foods, that means, you know, food that was built in a factory, out of chemicals that, that bears no relationship to the food that went before it. And that food massively undermines your ability to ever feel full and massively undermines your ability to know when to stop eating. Basically, my whole diet until I started taking these drugs pretty much came from these processed and ultra processed foods going right back to when I was a small child, right? Um, I realized now I had never felt full until I took these drugs. I had felt stuffed. I'd felt so stuffed I could not eat any more. But that's not the same as feeling full, right? Um, so, yeah, the food environment, we live in, and that raises the point you raised, which is a few months into taking these drugs, I went to my best friend and I said, I've got to stop taking them. I'm being a complete hypocrite. I write all these books about how we need to not deal with the superficial symptoms of our problems, but we need to deal with the root causes. But here I am with a problem plainly caused by the food supply and the way the food industry works. And here I am just treating the symptoms with a drug. I'm being a hypocrite. I need to stop. And this friend, um, she, seven years before she got very bad breast cancer and nearly died. She's a single mum. It was horrendous, as you can imagine. And I was with her all through the chemo and the double mastectomy and the hysterectomy. 
And she said to me, Johan, when I got cancer, you could have said to me, well, there's something in our environment that's causing breast cancer, right? One in seven British women gets breast cancer now. It's one in 38 in Japan, right? It, it's massive. It wasn't one in seven 30 years ago, right? There's something clearly in our environment and in Canada too. There's a brilliant Canadian called um, Professor Bruce Lans- Lanfear, who I've interviewed, who, who's done really important work on the role of pollutants. But there's something in our environment that is driving up cancer rates, right? But you didn't say, she said to me, you didn't say to me, well, Jesus, something in the environment poisoned you and gave you cancer. And now you're injecting, you now you're taking another load of poisons with chemo. She said, no, you said to me, let's make sure you live to fight another day. And once you live to fight another day, then we can find about more about the environmental contaminants and we can deal with them. But if you're dead, you can't do that. Right. And she gave me a really good analogy. She said to me, if your house is on fire, you could make a very strong argument that we should build houses out of less flammable materials and we should make it the law that you've got to put in sprinklers. Great idea. No damn use to you if your house is on fire. If your house is on fire, call the fire brigade and douse the house in water, right? And she said to me, you know, yeah, absolutely. We need to deal with the deep underlying factors that are driving up obesity. But if you're dead, you can't do that, right? It, 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 a moment to give myself a heart attack So to prove the harm of these things, you know, I believe passionately in gun control. I suspect you do too. But if someone is shot in front of me, I'm not going to stand over them and say, you know what? We really need to reverse the Supreme Court ruling on bump stocks and close the gun show loophole. I'm going to say, call a fucking ambulance. Right. And so there's no contradiction between dealing with deeper causes and immediate crises. In fact, you don't get to deal with the deeper crisis if you don't deal with the immediate problem. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, Johan, I remembered that Cheesecake Park story from your book. And the other day, I <laughs> I pulled a very ambitious mom move and tried to serve my teenage boys some like hippy dippy fucking nettle soup or something. <laughs> and <laughs> and, uh, and they turned their nose up on it. Surprise. And they said, can we just go out for food, please? And I told them, I was like, you guys are Cheesecake Park rats. You don't even <laughs> recognize the good food now. Um but it's true. And even, you know, even though I'm trying to raise my kids, you know, and I work in health and I'm there constantly shoving spinach at them or whatever, even so they are, you know, the first to say, can't we just please go get some burgers and fries? Um, so I think that it's, it's much more insidious than most of us think. A lot of us think, yeah, yeah, you know, that's, that's bad for, you know, a lot of people are eating junk food, but I'm not. And I think a lot of us are more affected by this environment than we think we are. Oh, more three-year-old children know what the McDonald's M means than know their own last name, yeah. right? So from the moment <laughs> your kids were born, before they could speak, they're being inculcated in these ideas. You know, try taking your kid for a walk in any city in Canada and then not be bombarded with junk food ads, right? Yeah, yeah. You won't yeah, be able to sure. do it. So, you know, you try doing your best, but you're running up or down escalator in this environment, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so in your book, you bring up that Japan has a completely different food culture. And you know, I'd heard that before. And I was always like, well, good for Japan it must be nice to be raised in a <laughs> land that has, you know, a thousand years of good food culture. But you point out that actually, it's been um, consciously engineered like that since the end of the Second World War. So we can turn this around. Can you talk a little bit about Japan and how they have developed, consciously developed a different food culture than we have? This blew my mind. So sometimes people say obesity is the inevitable effect of a country getting rich. If you just got a lot of money, inevitably people get fat because they can afford more food than they can, than they need. Right. And, you know, so they get a lot of people go, oh, it's just inevitable. People will inevitably need these drugs because you inevitably get obesity with development, right? And Japan proves that is absolutely not true because Japan is the third richest country in the world and has the same level of obesity as Somalia, right? 4% of Japanese people are obese compared to 42.5% of people in the United States. It's kind of weird that our mental picture of Japan is a sumo wrestler because it's basically (laughs) like expecting an American to look like a bald eagle, right? It's just the direct <laughs> uh, So I went to Japan to figure out how did they do it? 
And you're absolutely right, because firstly, you think, well, they must have just won the genetic lottery. It must be in their genes. We know that's not true, because in the 19th century, loads of Japanese people went to go and live in Hawaii. Um, and now they've been there for four generations. They haven't genetically mutated, but they have become like Americans. And Japanese Hawaiians are almost as fat as other Hawaiians, right? So it's not in their genes, right? There's something in their culture. And it's really interesting to look at this, because Professor Barack Kushner at Cambridge University has done a lot of work on this. Um if you go back to the just a little bit more than 100 years ago, Japanese people have one of the worst diets in the world. They only ate protein once a week. They have very poor life expectancy. Um, and the Japanese government decided very deliberately to improve the diet of Japanese people. Now, they didn't do it for a good reason. It's because they wanted them to be soldiers so they could go and invade and attack the rest of Asia. We all have our own <laughs> motives for weight loss, you know, let's not judge. Uh, but I don't mean, I think we should judge that one, but you know, more generally, let's not judge. Um, but so they very consciously changed the food culture of Japan. And I went to see how they do it. And they did it in some ways that we can totally replicate and some ways that we will not be able to replicate. Um, but it was really strange going around schools in Japan going to these really big schools with a thousand children, walking around and realizing there was not a single fat child in those schools, right? So I remember going to one, a, a school called, a school called Koenji school in Tokyo, kind of middle-class normal school. I was being shown around by a lovely woman called Harumi Tatibe, who's the nutritionist at the school. By law, every Japanese school has to employ a professional nutritionist. Her job is to design the school meals, which all by law have to be freshly prepared on the day. There cannot be one ounce of processed food in it. Kids are not allowed to bring in a packed lunch. They have to eat the food that's prepared there. And the nutritionist uses that fresh, healthy food to educate the children about why fresh and healthy food is important and how to enjoy it. And she showed me around and I'm like, where are the overweight children? She said, oh, I have got one overweight child I'm worried about. And she discreetly pointed out, and that child would not be regarded as fat in a Canadian school, right? I think, wow. So it was totally fascinating. You see these kids eat this fresh, healthy food. By law, by the way, also, the head teacher at the school has to eat the fresh food first. He has to eat the same food as the kids. And it has to contain all five food groups. And it was fascinating seeing her, you know, they're eating this food, which literally looks more like... I mean, it's more like Nobu than anything I ate at school, right? And these kids are eating it. And while she's doing it, she's educating them about the food group. She's explaining what they're eating and why it's good for them. Okay, now you're eating protein. Why is that important? Someone shouts out because it makes your bones strong, right? And I, now you're eating carbs. Why do they matter? They give you energy, right? And I was going around talking to these kids with my translator, Chie. And I would say to them, like, I remember, I'll never forget with this class of nine-year-olds. I said to them, what's your favorite food? And one kid said, broccoli. I was like, all right, who's this little freak? Go to this kid. White fish. The kid goes, another kid goes, white rice. And I turned to Chie after a while. And I said, are these kids trolling me, right? What their favorite foods are like, broccoli. Or what? And she just looked at me completely puzzled and said, well, we teach our kids to like healthy food, right? And every Japanese person was like puzzled by the fact that I was puzzled by the fact that their kids like healthy food, right? So they, right from the start, kids are taught to prepare, love, and consume fresh, healthy food, right? There are loads of other things Jap Japanese people do, some of which we can't do, right? There's a law. So in 2018, obesity went up in Japan by like 1%. And they had a massive freak out, right? I mean, like, it was like, to us, it seems like laughable. And they introduced a law known as the Metabo law, which requires, so this sounds, when I first heard about this, I thought this cannot possibly be true until I went to go and see it in practice. Every company in Japan has to weigh every single one of its employees who are over the age of 40 once a year. And if your weight has gone up, you have to draw up a plan with your employer to bring your weight down. And the employer has to register the um, weight of its employees with the government and if your company's weight overall goes up, you get fined by the government, right? It's just like, what is this? So the company go, gets fined? Company gets fined, right? Wow. Y your employees are too fat. Here's a fine, right? So I went to see how it works. And I went to a company where they weigh their workers, right? Uh, as every Japanese company has to. 
And it was so strange because I was talking to the employees and they're like, oh, it's really helpful to do this because it means that it gives me an incentive to keep my weight down. And I was like, yeah, if you did this in Britain or the United States, we would have burned the office down, right? Like that. And they were just like puzzled. They were like, why? And I really realized, oh, there is a cultural chasm here between me and, and them. So there's some things we can't do to be sure, but, but lots of things we can do, we can learn from Japan. And, you know, I really saw in Japan what you win if you get this right. So I went to Okinawa, which is the um, archipelago of islands at the bottom of Japan. Japan has the longest life expectancy in the whole world. And in Okinawa, there's a place that sounds almost mythical. It's called Ogimi. It's the village, it's the longest living village in the whole world, right? It, they've got, I think it's 240 households and more than 140 of them have someone over the age of 90 living in them. So I went there and I went to their little community center. And the first person I met was a woman called Matsu Fukuchi, who was 103 years old. She'd walked there on her own. She had a stick, but she walked there on her own from a house, from a big hill. And she turned up. She said, oh, I can't stay for long today because I'm looking after my son who fell off the roof fixing it the other day. I was like, Jesus, how old is your son? What's this about? But and we sat talking and she was 103. She had a great life. It was volleyball season. She loves watching volleyball with her grandchildren and her great grandchildren. She talked about how much she enjoyed life. And after a while of us talking and me talking to these other centenarians, someone put on some traditional Okinawan folk music and she started to dance. She put on this amazing red kimono. And I was dancing with this 103 year old woman. And I've got to say her moves were better than mine. And I thought, you know, this woman was born before they started having radio broadcasts in Japan. And I recorded my interview with her on an iPhone. This is what you get if you sort out the obesity crisis. Okay, not everyone gets to live to be 103, obviously. But you get more life. And not just more life, but more joyful life. You get to dance at 103, right? That's why I, I thought about how many people I know who are just crippled because they've been obese, because the food industry has screwed them up. Or how many people I know who never got to live to be, never mind 103, but never got to live to be 70, including m many of my relatives. I never, I never knew my grandfather because he didn't get to live because of this, right? So you think about that. The benefits of getting this right are so great. It's why some of us have to face this difficult choice now between obesity and these drugs. But more importantly, we can fix our culture so we don't have to make this choice, right? And that can sound a bit pie in the sky. Excuse me. That can sound a bit pie in the sky. But think about an example in our lifetimes. So like I said before, my mother is a massive chain smoker. There's a photograph of me and my mother when I'm six months old. She's breastfeeding me smoking and resting the ashtray on my <laughs> stomach, right? When I discovered this photo a few years ago, I thought she'd feel guilty. Exactly. I thought she'd feel guilty. She looked at the picture. She's Scottish. She said, you were a fucking difficult baby. I needed that cigarette. Right? She was totally <laughs> unrepentant. Um, but you think about this, right? I think if you could, if we could go back to our childhoods, right? If we could take your kids or my godsons or my nephews or my niece back to the Britain or Canada of, let's say, 1987, right? I think the thing that would most shock them is that people smoked everywhere. People smoked on the plane. People smoked in restaurants. People smoked on game shows. My doctor used to smoke while he examined me when I was a kid, right? Um, and you think about now, that is unthinkable, right? We've gone from more than half of Canadians and British people smoking to, I think in Britain, the figure is 12%. Okay, we've got an issue with vaping. That's a real issue, but it's much less bad than cigarette smoking. Um, so we've got, you know, that transformation happened as a result of concerted government policy demanded by ordinary people, right? We can do it if we want to. People were not this obese 50 years ago. We can fix it so that our children do not have a choice, have to make a choice between a risky drug and a risky medical condition. Um, we absolutely should do that right? We can do it. We should do it. Japan shows how to do it. I went to other countries that have done it. Mexico, the Netherlands, loads of places have introduced concerted government policies. Um, Finland, although I didn't go there, I interviewed people from there. Um, there's lots we can do here. It's a matter of will and us choosing to protect ourselves. 
I would love to talk about that Japan situation for a second because I remembered that story from your book about weighing the employees and no one I've told that story to has thought that that was a great idea. No, everyone was appalled. <laughs> um, and I think it's because we have this gut reaction against the stigma of gaining weight, which is good because we know, both you and I have known, we've both done our research on this, the more you stigmatize people, the more weight they gain. The worse they feel about themselves, the more weight they gain. But in Japan, it doesn't seem like a stigma so much as conforming to social norms. So I wonder why does one not work and one does? It's a really deep and important question. And I'm going to try to give you a really honest answer. It's a little bit uncomfortable. Um, so the honest answer is there is an enormous amount of stigma in Japan. Um, a huge amount of stigma towards obesity. What I suspect is the case. So what we know for sure is that stigma is a very poor tool for reversing obesity. In fact, it's counterproductive, right? For all the reasons we talked about, right? Um, I go through lots of reasons, five reasons in the book, but you know, you humiliate people, they want to comfort eat more, you make them hate their bodies, um, you make them more embarrassed to go to the doctor, uh, you make them more embarrassed to go and exercise because they'll be sneered at and humiliated. They're just across the board, it's once someone has become obese, it's really, really bad tool for promoting change and getting them back to a healthier weight. I think it's possible that stigma does have some preventive value if you have not become obese, right? I'm still against it, right? But um, think about that in relation to smoking, right? Smoking is much more stigmatized now than it was when we were teenagers, right? And one of the reasons I didn't smoke is because I knew that the hot boys I wanted to make out with would not want to make out with me if I smoked, right? So stigma did even though I actually had been basically gassed my entire childhood, um, I, I didn't smoke partly for that reason. So I suspect the stigma is a very poor tool for reversing the problem, but it may have some role in preventing the problem. Now, I hate stigma so much that I hate to say that. Well, I think and, you can say that in conjunction with a supportive environment. Yeah, you know, um, yeah. I would say another example like that is drinking and driving. Drinking and driving mm. was pretty kind of okay for the boomers. And my generation, mm. it really reversed. And we have more public transportation, you know, and, and, but that only works sure. if we've got more public transportation, et cetera, I, I suspect. Yeah. yeah, that's a really interesting way of putting it. I mean, I think it, I think it's very hard to decouple stigma from cruelty. That's why I hate it. Right. Yeah. And it's ve I, mean, I think it's actually impossible. I think stigma is a form of cruelty. Um, and they're really mean about it. Like, I mean, one of the funniest experiences I had for the book, the bleakly funny experiences was trying to explain the concept of fat pride to Japanese people to get their comment on it. And they just literally couldn't understand what I was saying. So I would go, so there's some people, um, in, in the West who would say we shouldn't be ashamed of being fat, that actually we should be proud of it. And they would look at me blankly and go, so we understand there are people who are very sad about being fat. And I go, no, that's not what I mean. Right. And they literally just couldn't process what I was saying. The idea seemed to them just so bizarre. Um, yeah, so, you know, there are aspects of the Japanese model we can learn from and the aspects we wouldn't want to learn from, right? Like, I'm not saying we should become fully Japanese. I don't, I wouldn't want that. Um, and it's a much less individualistic and much more conformist society in general. And I like our ornery individualism right like so there's a lot i wouldn't want to imitate from from japan but a lot we can learn and i think the biggest thing we can learn is just that you can really radically transform a food culture right yeah i thought that was fascinating uh, i mean and and in a way we shouldn't need japan tells that because we have radically transformed our food culture just <laughs> in, in a negative way. direction yeah. right yeah, yeah. Um, I want to talk about what's next, uh, both for you and for society. So um, <laughs> I was listening to another interview that you did, and you you casually mentioned that you had had uh, for breakfast that morning a packet of peanut M&Ms. And I am not judging <laughs> at all, but I'm so curious, if you don't have the craving for junk food, and you are obviously so well informed about the benefits of whole unprocessed food, blah, 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 um, I guess what I'm wondering is, is there hope for people who are on Ozempic that without the cravings and the appetite that they will start to gravitate, like reform their habits and, um, and then they can kind of wean themselves off of Ozempic and live a happy, healthy life. And I'm wondering, are you noticing that for yourself and what are your plans for your personal use of this drug? Do you want to stay on it forever? Are you trying to shift habits? 
Is it happening naturally? The answer is a bit complicated. Um, the honest answer is. So one of the things we know is that, because you said, oh, you know so much about it, it's surprising, it's a natural thing to say. One of the things we know from 50 years of diet research is giving people psychological insights into their eating can help with all sorts of things. It can reduce shame, um, it, it boosts self-knowledge, but psychological insights into eating ha do not at all change how you eat, right? Just giving people, there's loads of research on this. Professor Michael Lowe at Drexel University in Philly has done a lot on this. Um, it's why just giving people psychological therapies for overeating sadly doesn't work when it comes to reducing their eating. It does benefit them in other ways. Um, I'm a big fan of therapy, but it's not a good diet at all, right? Um, so it should, knowing that, it shouldn't be surprising that giving me psychological insight doesn't necessarily kind of solve my problem. I had a weird thing for the first six or seven months that I was taking the drugs where I'm going to put it crudely. I was eating smaller portions of the same old shit, right? I, um, all of my eating habits were formed around junk food, literally all of them. Um, and I was aware that that was an improvement, but not the end destination anyone should want, right? So yeah, I was still going to McDonald's, but instead of getting a large Big Mac meal with six nuggets, I would get, a hamburger, right? Now, that's a huge improvement, but it's, you know, I remember talking to this about one of the Professor Robert, do, sorry, Dr. I remember talking about this with Dr. Robert Kushner, who is one of the scientists who worked on the drugs and him saying, well, look, it, it's good that you're losing weight, but there's also an independent factor, which is nutrition. And if you're not giving your body the nutrients it needs, you're not going to be as healthy as you could be. Um, so I learned to cook. I'm a little bit better than I was. That's great. But honestly, not much. I have a nettle uh, soup know, recipe uh, for you if you want to. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, it's it's uh, partly because I'm on the road a lot. I travel a lot for my work. Um, but partly, I mean, that's probably me making excuses for myself, partly because it's very deeply ingrained habits. Since I went to Japan, I eat a lot of Japanese food. Um, I, I'm better than I was. But yeah, I mean, I still eat a lot of junk food. It's just, uh, or rather, junk food still makes up a high percentage of what I, of the food that I do eat. It's just... I went from eating about 3,200 calories a day to eating about 1,800 calories a day. Um, maybe a little bit more some days now. Um, in terms of whether, whether I'm going to continue. So for me, it was when the studies came out about heart disease that it decided it for me, right? This reduces your heart disease risk by 20%. Given how many of the men in my family get heart disease and die of it, I just thought, okay, this I'm, I'm worried about lots of the long term side effects, but for me, that that's, that's now lots of other people will read magic pill, look at the risks and benefits and think, Oh, wow. I'm not, I mean, it's fascinating to me how many people, people have read the book. It's a bit like, do you remember the dress where some people saw it as, you know, orange or whatever. Loads of people have written to me and said, I loved your book. It made me convinced to take Ozempic. I'm really glad. And loads of other people wrote to me going, I loved your book. Thank God you argued so strongly against Ozempic. I'd be crazy to take it. So it's fascinating to me. And I feel like that's a sign that I did my job because the, the, the truth about this is complicated. You know, I, I couldn't have written a book that was like, rah, rah, Ozempic will save your life and there's nothing bad to see here. And I couldn't have written a book that said it's the devil and don't take it. It's complicated, right? It will save the lives of people with heart disease like me potentially with heart disease. It will kill some people with eating disorders. There are all sorts of, and there's lots of people in between, right? And we all have to make a calculation for ourselves. Um, and it's not easy. And I don't have a high degree of confidence that I've made the right decision, partly because there's so much we don't know. Uh, so it's possible someone will find this podcast in 40 years time and think, oh, what a fool he was to not listen to that thyroid cancer warning. That was a harbinger of saying much worse. Or what a fool he was to not listen to what he was saying about the unknown long-term risks. Or uh, there's all sorts of things that could happen here, mm. some of which could be catastrophic, right? Um, mm -hmm. But I know that my obesity was going to be catastrophic, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what do you think, uh, so that's for you or for individuals, what do you think are the most extreme examples of how this could play out in society? in say 10, 20 years? Well, bear in mind that eight years from now, the Ozempic goes out of patent. So it'll be a daily pill and it'll be a dollar a day. Huh. Unless the 12 risks that I'm writing about turn out to be worse than we currently know. And I don't rule that out at all. 
But unless that happens, I would predict that more than half of Canadians will be taking that pill. Um, and the thing I'm most worried about is people with eating disorders. So anyone who's known anyone with an eating disorder knows that there's a conflict going on within them. There's the biological part of them that wants to live and wants to eat. And then there's a the psychological part of them that for complicated psychological reasons wants to starve themselves. And what these drugs do is they massively empower that psychological part of you. This is why Dr. Kimberly Dennis, one of the leading experts on eating disorders in the United States, said to me, these drugs are rocket fuel for eating disorders. There's something we can do about that. And I really urge everyone listening to really call your member of parliament and lobby for this that could forestall the worst of this. Um, so the worst case scenario, we're going to have an opioid like death toll of young girls it is overwhelmingly young girls who get eating disorders. There are some young boys and some older people, but it is mostly young girls, young girls who starve themselves to death using these drugs who would not have died had they not got these drugs. This is why eating disorders experts like Dr. Dennis are saying very strongly, we need to urgently regulate these drugs more tightly. So I, I can see from looking at you, you know, you are clearly not eligible for these drugs, right? I can see you on Riverside. You, you, no responsible doctor should give you these drugs. I guarantee you, you could go on Zoom in five minutes. You get a Zoom, di a Zoom diagnosis five minutes after we have this conversation and you get them delivered to your home tomorrow morning. Well, right? I'm targeted so, with ads that say that all the time because I've been re researching it. Like every third ad wow. in my feed right now is all, uh, get this drug sent to you today. Yeah. Wow. That's mm -hmm. really sobering. And you think about that. So doctors are meant to check your BMI and are, unless you've got type two diabetes, they're not meant to give this drug to you uh, unless you've got a BMI higher than 27. But how are doctors on Zoom doing that? I mean, I think about, so I, I spent, divide my time between the U Britain and the US. And I initially got these drugs in Britain and then I was in Vegas and um, I went to a, a clinic to get them there because I didn't want to, you know, because uh, I'd run out. And um, by the time I went to the clinic, I was had a BMI much lower than 27. I think it was like 23. I told them I was already using the drugs, but I could have been, I didn't ask for any proof of that, right? Uh, and they, I, I'm not even sure they asked, now I think of it. Um, I'd have to check my notes. But either way, I was a man who walked in with a healthy BMI and they gave me the drug with barely any questions, right? Um, so what Dr. Dennis and other people argue is we need to stop Zoom prescription of these drugs you should only be able to get these drugs through an in-person appointment with a doctor who actually checks your BMI. And if your BMI is, if you're not overweight or obese, you should not be given these drugs. And they should also be trained in detecting eating disorders so they can refer you for help. If we don't do that, I'm really worried that in addition to the incredible benefits of these drugs, we will have a really, really catastrophic wave of, of, of deaths. There's no other way of putting it. I think it's already begun, in fact. Well, anyone who is at all curious about these drugs, whether it's right for them, or even anyone who's curious about like the future of public health, should definitely, definitely read your book. But is there any oh. final thoughts that you want to leave with anyone listening? God, we've covered so many things and there's so much more in the book. I mean, I guess I would say, you know, I was so ashamed when I was overweight. I was so embarrassed about it. And learning this evidence, I sort of realized, oh, I wasn't a failure. I was an entirely typical product of our environment. And there's something about learning more about what's causing obesity that gives you, a, as in, any, in any case, has given me a real relief and release from that sense of shame. So I'd say if you're overweight or obese, you haven't done anything wrong. This isn't your fault. Someone did this to you. The food industry did this to all of us. They gave us foods they actually knew undermine our ability to ever feel full and make us overeat. There's some pretty shocking, you know, leaked memos in the book from the food industry. Um, and we should stop being angry with ourselves and start being angry with the forces that did this to us and start regulating them so our kids don't face these choices in the future between these drugs and, and, and obesity. Those are great final words. Johan, you've been so generous with your time. I loved this conversation and I love oh. Magic Pill. It's a great oh. book. Yeah. What a pleasure. Thank you so much. I meant to say, or my um, lovely Canadian publicist Shona will taser me that um, <laughs> uh, 
if you want to know where to get the audio book, the ebook, oh, yeah. physical book, you can go to magicpillbook.com or for my other books, you can go to J O H A N N H A R I.com. You can see where to follow me on social media. Um, and, uh, I meant to say you can get it from all good bookstores, but you can also get it from shitty bookstores. We don't have any quality <laughs> tests. There's no, you know, like your, your bookstore is not good enough for my, for magic pill. Damn you. Uh, yeah, but I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much. You know, what you ask great questions. Oh, awesome. And I'll leave all the links to all the stuff, of course, with the podcast. Yeah. Hooray. Yay. Thank you so much, Johan. It's been great to meet you. I appreciate it. Oh, what a pleasure. Thanks so much. I'm going to go and eat some Japanese food appropriately <laughs> enough. Enjoy. With my godson. See you Brilliant. later. Mwah. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye. Well, my friend, I hope you found that conversation interesting. As I mentioned, I didn't think I was interested in Ozempic at all before I read Johan's book, Magic Pill. As you can imagine, I hear a lot about miracle weight loss cures, and it's always fucking bullshit. So when I started to read about Ozempic and the unprecedented results and the fact that it actually reduces your mind chatter about food, I got really excited. I have spent my whole career trying to answer the question, what would the world be like if the 40% of women who are constantly thinking about weight loss just don't have to think about that anymore? Think of the fucking human potential unleashed. And so even for my personal work, without the distraction of wanting to get thinner, we could actually start working on fitness and wellness. I mean, which we do, we 100% do, but there's always the undercurrent of weight loss wants. Anyway, then huh, I learned about the risks and the fact that it's a lifelong drug and we have no idea how it's going to affect us long term. And that most people gain the weight back after they go off it. And the risks that people who are not obese are going to abuse these drugs to lose the last 10 pounds. And by the way, Johan didn't mention it, but he does give a really good summary recommendation. So this is what he says. Anyone over the BMI of 35 would probably benefit from these drugs. Anyone from a BMI of 27 to 35 might want to talk to their doctor to weigh the pros and the cons. Anyone under a BMI of 27, the risks outweigh the benefits. Now, that's obviously a total oversimplification. And if you have any interest in this subject, definitely read his book, Magic Pill. And if you've got something to add to this conversation, I would love to hear it. Feel free to reach out on Instagram at Una Duncan. Until next week. Hey, dude, thanks for listening. If you like this episode, make sure you're subscribed so you can get the next one. And by the way, if you rate and review this podcast, it really helps me get found by other people who need some goals, grit, and some woo-woo shit. And be sure to connect and DM me at Una Duncan on Instagram and let me know what you thought of the episode. Chat soon. <laughs>